Hi there. My name is Aaron Lantraman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and this lecture will be on the use of complex numbers in electrical and computer engineering, and in particular, an aspect of them called the roots of unity. We use them extensively in digital signal processing, which is the main topic of EC 2026, Introduction to Signal Processing, but they also play a fundamental role in the analysis of electric circuits. And I like to think about a lot of electric circuits as just analog signal processors. The thing circuit analysis and DSP have in common is that both fields are highly interested in studying sinusoids. Now, there are electrical engineers who work in the area of device physics that have to deal with things at the quantum level. And in quantum physics, complex numbers play a fundamental role. So anyone working with quantum computers will inevitably be swimming in complex numbers. Our use of complex numbers in EC2026 and in your typical circuits class like EC2040 is different in that you could technically work through all of your various problems without the complex numbers, but the complex numbers sure make your job a whole lot easier. Basically, it lets you avoid using trigonometric identities. You can do equivalent algebraic manipulations that are simpler. So in EC2026, complex numbers aren't quite as fundamental as they are in quantum physics. They're basically a trick, but they are an incredibly useful trick. So you need to make sure you're comfortable with them. The presentation of complex numbers is usually motivated by writing down this equation z squared equals minus 1, noting it doesn't have any real solutions, and then somebody saying, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we pretended it did have a solution? In electrical engineering, we call this J. The entire rest of the world calls this I. And the I makes sense because I stands for imaginary, but in electrical engineering, I stands for current. To avoid that confusion with current, doublies like to use J. Now, imaginary numbers were actually developed in the context of trying to solve cubic equations. Veritasium has an excellent video on the topic. I'll leave a link to that in the description below. We think about complex numbers as existing in a two-dimensional Cartesian coordinate space. X here is a real number that's the real part. Y here is also a real number, but that's the imaginary part since we stick a J in front of it. We plot the real part on the horizontal axis and the imaginary part on the vertical axis. We use this kind of notation to extract the real and imaginary parts from a complex number. One thing you want to be careful with is that when you take the imaginary part of a number, that result itself is a real number. So on an exam, if we ask you what's the imaginary part of 2 plus j5, do not write J5. This is very, very wrong. We'll take off points. To add two complex numbers, here are Z1 and Z2, you just add the real parts and then separately add the imaginary parts. So you can think about forming a head-to-tail diagram like in your mechanical engineering statics class. This example used two complex numbers, but this extends to an arbitrary number of complex numbers that you want to add. In addition to thinking about Cartesian coordinates, it's often convenient to express complex numbers in terms of a polar coordinate system. Here we have an angle theta and a magnitude r. The magnitude is just the length of this vector, so we can convert from Cartesian to polar coordinates by squaring the real part, squaring the imaginary part, adding them, and taking the square root. Now to compute the angle, if the angle theta is in this range of pi over 2 to minus pi over 2, and I should have mentioned that we generally use radians for theta, you can use this formula with the arc tangent of the imaginary part over the real part. Now you have to treat this formula with caution. If your actual theta is over here, then you need to apply a correction. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Sometimes people will write the polar form of a complex number using the same kind of notation with parentheses and a comma that they do for a Cartesian number, but you want to be careful to specify what kind of coordinate system you're using. I actually don't like this very much. Now for this particular example, 
you could take 2 squared and get 4, 3 squared and get 9, 4 plus 9 is 13. So our angle is square root of 13. And there's really no easy way to simplify the arctangent of 3 over 2. You just have to punch that into your calculator. And just to be clear, this indicates arctangent, the inverse tangent. It doesn't mean 1 over tangent. I really want to go back in time and tell whoever made up this notation that it's a bad idea. A clear notation for the polar form, which I prefer, is this angle notation. But all of this is really syntactic sugar for this form here, r e to the j theta. That's not a special notation. That's really just a piece of math. I'll talk about this e to the j business a little bit later. I mentioned you have to be careful with the arctangent. Let's think about converting this complex number with a real part of 3 and an imaginary part of 1 into polar form. To get the length, we take 3 and square it. That gives us 9. 1 and square it gives us 1. 9 plus 1 equals 10. Take the square root. And then we ask our calculator what that is. And we'll also ask our calculator what the arctangent of 1 third is. 1 is the imaginary part and 3 is the real part. Quite often, we'll take whatever our calculator tells us and divide it by pi, so we can write our angle as a multiple of pi. That's all well and good, but what about this case here? What if we have a complex number with a real part of minus 3 and an imaginary part of minus 1? There's no problem in computing the length of the vector, since when I plug the minuses in here and I square the minuses, those go away. But if I brute force take minus 1, which is the imaginary part, and divide it by minus 3, by the time I hit the arctangent button on my calculator, my calculator has forgotten that there's minus signs here. It would just take the tangent of 1 over 3, and it will give me the wrong angle. It will give me the angle for this vector here. So if you look at your imaginary part and your real part, and you notice you're in this lower left quadrant, what you need to do is take the result of that arctangent and subtract pi, aka 180 degrees, to swing your vector around to get the right answer. Similarly, if your actual point is up here in the upper left quadrant, then the result of the arctangent will give you an angle associated with the lower right quadrant, and you need to add pi in order to swing your vector around and get it in the right spot. So what if you have a complex number in this polar form and you want to convert it to a rectangular form? Well, if we look at this triangle here, we see that we can just use some trigonometry. The real part is going to be r, the magnitude, times cosine, the angle. And the imaginary part is going to be r, the magnitude, times sine of the angle. Now, a lot of calculators know how to handle complex numbers and will do these conversions for you including handling all that weirdness with arctangent, but it's important that you understand the underlying concepts. Now, earlier I promised I would tell you what's going on with this e to the j theta business. This is where Euler's formula comes in. It says that e to the j theta equals cosine theta plus j sine theta. This looks a little weird at first glance. The most common proof you'll see probably involves Taylor series expansions of these quantities, but there's other ways to prove it. I will include some links to videos that talk about different proofs in the description below. Now, considering the magnitude of this, recall the trig identity that says that cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta equals 1. So, this has a magnitude of 1, and as you increase theta, you basically spin around the unit circle. And if I want a vector with a different magnitude, I can just multiply everything by r. Let's focus a little bit on that angle. I could rewrite this complex number, minus 3 minus j3, in polar form as 3 squared of 2 e to the j 5 pi over 4, if I really insisted on having a positive angle. But remember, this angle is on a circle. It's ambiguous with multiples of 2 pi. I could add or subtract multiples of 2 pi, equivalently 360 degrees, and wind up at the same point. So if I subtract 2 pi from pi over 4, 
that's like subtracting 8 pi over 4, I wind up with minus 3 pi over 4. Now, when we represent angles, we typically want to represent them as going between minus pi and pi, including pi, but not including minus pi. That's just a convention. You can multiply complex numbers in Cartesian form using just regular algebra. The real part of the first number and the real part of the second number get multiplied to give me this term. And when I multiply these final terms here, notice that j times j equals negative 1. So I wind up with this minus y1, y2 term here. And then I have these quantities times j from the cross terms. So here I have the real part, and here I have the imaginary part of the product. Now, if you have your complex numbers in polar form, it's a lot easier. You can just multiply the magnitudes and add the phases. So addition is easier in Cartesian coordinates, but multiplication is easier in polar coordinates. Now, when people actually write computer algorithms, they usually do all of the computations in the Cartesian form because they represent the underlying complex numbers in Cartesian form. But when we interpret the results, we usually want to look at the results in polar form. You'll see why I say that in future lectures. We can think about complex multiplication as scaling the length of a vector and as rotating a vector. This gives us a way of interpreting power operations. A power is just a repeated multiplication, so taking a complex number to a power corresponds to repeated rotations. In this particular example, the magnitude of our vector is 1, so it maintains the same length. If the magnitude was less than 1, then the vector would shrink as it rotates. If it's greater than 1, it would lengthen as it rotates. Complex conjugation is an operation we're going to use a lot. We represent it using the superscript asterisk. It involves taking the imaginary component and flipping the sign on it. That mirrors it along the horizontal axis. And if you think about what the angle looks like here, you can see that this corresponds to flipping the sign on the angle in polar form. And that's also immediately obvious if you remember the trigonometric identity, that sign of minus something equals minus sine something. We'll quite often take a complex number and multiply it by its complex conjugate, because that's often a convenient way to compute the magnitude squared of a complex number. Now, if you take a complex number and divide it by its complex conjugate, you get a complex number with a magnitude of 1, and you double the angle. Notice that if we take a complex number and add its complex conjugate, the imaginary parts wind up canceling, and you just get twice the real part. So think for a second, what happens if you subtract the complex conjugate of a number from itself? A few seconds of thought will tell you that gives you twice the imaginary part. We'll use these properties quite a bit in future lectures. When working with complex numbers, it's good to have something like a compass in your head. Thinking about the vector pointing east, that's 1 and that corresponds to e to the j0, or e to the j any multiple of 2 pi. Pointing to the west, that corresponds to minus 1. I can think about that as e to the j pi. Again, add or subtract any multiple of 2 pi. Going to the north, that corresponds to j. That's equivalent to e to the j pi over 2. And again, you could add or subtract multiples of 2 pi. Pointing to the south, that's minus j. That corresponds to e to the minus j pi over 2. And again, I can add or subtract multiples of 2 pi. So if I think about going this direction, I think about minus pi over 2. And if I go this direction, I think about 3 pi over 2. Although usually we want to use this minus pi over 2 form. Another form that shows up a lot is when the real and imaginary parts have the same magnitude. So for instance, 1 plus j would be something like this. That would have a magnitude of square root of 2 and an angle of pi over 4. That's pointing towards the northeast. 1 minus j would be pointing down this direction. 
pointing to the southeast, so that would have an angle of minus pi over 4. What if I switch that plus minus symbol? Well, 1 plus j is pointing to the northeast as it was before. Minus 1 plus j would be pointing to the northwest, so that would have an angle of 3 pi over 4. To wrap up, let's talk about the roots of unity. What if you need to solve the equation z to the n equals 1? Well, if z is equal to r e to the j theta, z to the n is r to the n e to the j and theta, and I can write 1 as e to the j integer multiples of 2 pi. So thinking about this expression here, it's clear that r needs to be equal to 1, but then to satisfy the equality, I can set n theta equal to 2 pi k. Solving the resulting equation for theta, I find theta equals 2 pi k over n. So I actually have n solutions. Those are e to the j 2 pi k over n, where k goes from 0 to n minus 1. So my solutions are all equally spaced around the unit circle. What if we were to sum all of these solutions? You might guess that the answer would be 0, because it looks like these vectors are pulling evenly and equally in all directions. And we can actually prove that mathematically using our formula for a geometric sum. And to be clear, our use of r here is not the same as our use of r on the previous slides. We see that it indeed equals 0, because this n cancels with this n and e to the j 2 pi equals 1. Interestingly, the roots of unity show up in my EC4450 analog circuits for a music synthesis class in a lecture where I analyze the famous Moog ladder filter. If you would like to get some practice with complex numbers, there is this Z-drill GUI that's part of the SP-first toolbox that you can get from the DSP-first website.